Hi everyone, I'm Giselle Fernandez for Los Angeles Magazine, and this is Big Shots. This is a series where we track down the big shots, titans of industry, movers and shakers who pass through Los Angeles every day and we don't know about it till now. We track them down, we want to find out what brings them to our fine city, what business trends are happening in their various industries so we learn a little something when they're here. We want to find out what they love best about Los Angeles. We want to know when they're coming back. Today's big shot is a powerful woman in Los Angeles. Yes, she's the wife of billionaire Chaim Saban. But Dr. Cheryl Saban has many titles. She is psychologist, best-selling author, uber philanthropist, and recent presidential appointee to the United Nations General Assembly, where she just recently advocated for the rights of women and children across the globe. But what makes Dr. Saban truly powerful and influential is her first row seat to the alarming disparity of wealth in this country. Her serious engagement with real women and families here in Los Angeles and across the nation gives her unique positioning to speak truth to power and to be a real voice for the voiceless. And as her conviction goes well beyond just writing a check, she's a true change agent who wants to encourage others to follow in her footsteps. Tell me about your first year representing the United Nations as a presidential appointee with the United Nations. Challenging, um, insightful, what was your biggest surprise? I was very impressed on many, many levels, and I was disheartened also on, on multiple levels. I think that the United States population as a whole doesn't have a clue what's going on in the UN. We typically think, oh, what are we supporting it for? We, we spend so much money there, we get nothing done. And part of that's true. It's, it's hugely dysfunctional. It's a big bureaucracy. On the other hand, um, it's the only thing we've got to bring all of these nations together. And we do, there is a lot getting done there. Each country has one vote. And one of the most difficult things to, to watch, actually, as a United States citizen who is extremely proud of being a United States citizen, was that we are, we are, <laughs> we are not uh, as persuasive as I thought we always were. In what way? We're big givers around the world. We, we put ourselves out there for everyone, I think. Uh, not always in, the, in necessarily the right way. I don't say that we have all the answers. But we can't persuade everyone to do what we want in the UN. And a lot of these nations are bulking up their muscles, even though they don't have the political savvy, I don't think, and the, um, the know-how and the sophistication and, and the democratic um, principles in place. What I'm saying is the United States needs to pay attention. And of our relationship there and the few friends that we have, what I noticed and what I saw and observed about how tough it is for Israel broke my heart. Broke my heart, honestly. Because of the division and politics of the various nations? Because we stand alone with them very often. With Canada, with a few other countries, but it is so disproportionately represented there. So you see the anti-Semitism oh, more there gosh. in a centralized place than anywhere. Oh, it's, it's stunning, the hypocrisy that goes on. And that was very, very clear. So we, have, uh, we are constantly protecting our allies. That was something I saw very clearly. Made you proud. Made me very proud. You very also proud. Um, were present for the status, um, the Commission on the Status of Women. Yes, CSW 57, which was extraordinary. And once again, we have you know, thousands of people coming together from all over the world, and women working tire, men and women working tirelessly for two weeks, you know, night and day, to come up with a, um, a functional uh, paper that everyone could sign off on. And this document was to basically ban violence and discrimination against women for gender or sex? Um, it was trying to do that. Uh, we made lots of gains in this document. And we did, in the end, get it signed. In Los Angeles, are we aware, do we have a clue about what's really happening to others in the world. And if we did, would we do more if we really had an insight to what was happening? 
you know, not, not everyone understands, I don't think. I think we get very, I think we become um, more concerned about what's going on in our own backyard. We have severe issues right here at home. I'm involved in a capital campaign right now, for example, with Stewart House and the Rape Treatment Center. We have a big, big problem in our city of child rape and molestation. And that's a hard thing to even get out of my mouth. That's going on right here in, in good old Los Angeles. Um, so we can't be pointing fingers all over the world about violence against women when we know it's going on right here. I, I heard you speak at the women's conference, mm -hmm. Maria Shriver's Phenomenal mm -hmm. Women Conference, and you spoke openly about being raped. Is that yes. what fuels your activism in this, in this area? Absolutely. I was raped and the police were horrible to me. The reason I, I'm, I throw myself into this with such vigor is because uh, we need to shift that. This needs to stop. And so <laughs> I will be on the woman's side. And I have chosen that path. So with my foundation and the things that we do, I will be on the side of the women and children who can't speak for themselves. The lion's share of the people are Latino. When they don't get their needs met, the whole community doesn't do well. And it reflects on, on our city. Is the city doing enough to narrow the gap? You know, I wish I had the answer to that. But I think we must stay engaged. So we have to vote. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm not going to make a difference. Why should I bother? You have to vote. If you don't use your voice that way, you certainly won't have a choice in anything. We do need more women to be engaged. You were a big advocate of Wendy Gruel, who did not make it. I was appalled by the fact that we didn't have a lot of turnout in the first go round. I couldn't understand that. But as I said, that's part of it. When people don't show up, they're not compelled, they're not engaged in actually being part of the process. What do you hope the new mayor will bring to the city? Oh my goodness, I hope, I really hope that the new mayor will bring some transportation that functions. I would like to see a subway or a monorail. A monorail would be nice that goes all the way to the beach, that goes to the airport and actually stops there. I mean, we, as a big city, don't have a stop at the airport. I think it's nuts. I would also like to see us have more green spaces in our town. Are, are there um, leaders in LA that you admire here you think are doing a good job? You know, um, there, are, there are plenty. I admire, uh, Ann Sweeney is one that I really admire. She's been, um, she's one of the top in her field and I've known her for a long time. I admire uh, the head of La, La Opinion, Monica La, Lozano. Monica La Opinion. She's a heavyweight in this town. We have some heavyweights in our city that are really movers and shakers. What woman has had the biggest impact on you? Hillary Clinton? Uh, you know, I think it would be probably Hillary, maybe it would be then Sherry Lansing, and, and then Ariana Huffington. Ariana is one of my heroes. She doesn't give up. Best part of Los Angeles? <laughs> the weather <laughs> and the fact that we're so, such a great mixture of people. We have it all here. And, and uh, you, if you really can find it all if you look. Worst part? Ah, the mini malls. The mini malls and the cement and the, the bat and the traffic. I put that all together. I wish I was a city planner. I wish I was part of the early city planning. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they wouldn't want me. They would not. I would be so tough. Best place to uh, eat sushi? Oh, Sushi Zo. It is in a tiny little strip mall. It is the best sushi, I think, really? in the city and maybe in the, it's, it's marked number one in Zaga. And can you choose which, what, what you oh, get? No, no, no. no, no. no. This is omakase. This is a makase, and you will not be disappointed, I promise. What are you most proud of, of, of the work that you do? When, when people meet me, they know that I care about women and children, and that the money that, that I have is going towards helping them. I think it's important to give back to society. Haim and I feel it's incumbent upon us to help. I mean, it's just the way we were 
It's the way we feel inside. Well, you, you do a lot. <laughs> no, I don't. Not compared to, I mean, I do a little. I think if you put a little on a little, you do get a lot. This is an old, old saying. Everyone can do something. If, it is, if you don't have money, that's OK. You can volunteer. If you have, but I think all of us have something to give. Well, I think you do a lot. And um, I think you're a role model for a lot of women as an author and as a speaker and just your compassion and your philanthropy. Uh, and now your work with the UN, I think you're a role model for all of us and how we can use our own voices to empower so much in our lives around us. So thank you for joining us on Los Angeles Magazine. Dr. Cheryl Saban, you can log on to her website, which is what, A Woman's Worth? It's www.whatisyourselfworth.com. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you. And we'll see you again in our next episode of Big Shots. For Los Angeles Magazine, I'm Giselle Fernandez. So long.